if you reward somebody for working late because, and you say things like, Hey, I know you have kids at home. I know that, you know, you usually go home and you're with your family and you stayed work late and you took care of this. I want to really thank you for that. Well, that creates dopamine. It makes somebody feel like they've accomplish something and help somebody else. And that creates better dopamine and this better health has been proven as healthier for them to feel like they've given to others than to getting. And that makes them want to do it more than to say, congratulations on closing this deal. Because what you did was you created a story that they can visualize in their head and make sure that you they can associate what they've done to what they sacrificed. And that promotes a healthy work environment. Good morning, HR. I'm Mike Coffey, and this is the podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value for shareholders, customers, and the community. Please follow, rate, and review Good Morning HR on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at goodmorninghr.com. Most leaders have had the experience of being completely baffled by the decisions of those they lead. What were they thinking? And if we're honest, most of us have also been baffled at times by our own decisions. What was I thinking? My guest today says that science can help us understand the decisions that we and others make, giving us the opportunity to change our lives as well as transform the organizations we lead. Julian Sato is Executive Vice President of Learning and Development at Equity Prime Mortgage. He's a licensed neuro-linguistic practitioner and a behavioral coach. Over his career, he has consulted with dozens of organizations to build engaged sales, service, and leadership teams. (laughs) He's also been a kickboxing coach and a Hollywood talent agent. Welcome to Good Morning HR, Julia. Hey, well, thank you very much, Mike. Happy to be here. So, I don't even know, where do we start? What does (laughs) science tell us about how we make decisions? Well, actually, science with the new modalities and the way to measure the brain function, we're able to see that our brains see everything from a fight or flight response. And when we're in fight or flight, that response alone changes the logic of how we visualize our situations. And so it's given us the ability to say that it's not this person doing something, it's nature doing it. So we literally become less rational. We are impulsive. We become very like black or white. There's no in between. And we just literally just react. And we all have had those moments, right? From like road rage where somebody cuts you off and you'll start yelling at them without any concern that you're doing something that can endanger you. And that's what happens to the brain when people feel like they're in danger. But the difference is what is danger now? That's been redefined as we know it. So, okay. So what is that? What does that mean? What is danger? Because I mean, you're not saying we live in fight or flight 100% of the time. I think the cortisol would be through the roof, right? We'd be, we, but, but what is danger? What, tri- what, what, what triggers that stuff? Well, that's exactly the point. Is that danger is anything that it goes against what we believe to be safe. Now, our ego is sometimes bruised, which is unsafe. So to your point, danger doesn't mean a lion in the forest anymore. It could mean somebody disagreeing with you on a tweet. It could mean a little stink eye somebody you perceive gives you at the office or your boss saying, hey, come to my office. I need to talk to you. That alone creates the same amount of cortisol as if you're in a street fight. And that's what we're able to determine now that the subconscious doesn't deem the level of danger. It just sees danger and produces the same amount of cortisol in every situation. So we're in fight or flight mode. Um, Do we have any, I mean, does this lead to a strict determinism? Do we have any control over our decisions or we do we do it it goes back to understanding that the brain shuts down the neocortex which is a frontal lobe of our brain which really is the human side we call it which really we're the only creature on the planet that has 40 percent of our brain is a neocortex where we're conscious of self but when we feel like we're threatened even our ego threatened or our say we're embarrassed that neocortex literally shuts down the fi- the firing of the, the brain cells stop firing and the amygdala takes over and it populates that cortisol in the body and makes the heart beat faster that's because the blood moves to the muscles and it thinks you're in some fight or flight situation so it, we have control but what we have to do is define 
what we're feeling right now. When you recognize that this is not danger and you start talking yourself down or backwards, I call it, you're able to release that as danger and recognize for what it is. Unfortunately, most people don't. We usually react and then think about it. So the goal is to think about it before you react. And that helps you calm down that neocortex, uh, that amygdala and think more clearly. So I've been married 25 years. And I think in year 24, I learned to stop yes. and think about what I'm going to say before I <laughs> say it, um, at least with her and nobody else. But we get into these situations then it's, and, and we feel our blood pressure going up or our ears getting red or whatever the, the physical response is, or we just know this guy I'm talking to is full of BS and I got to put him in his place. Um, what do we do? I mean, so we recognize that this, that this is what's happening, but how do we get, how do we, what is there to help us learn to behave more appropriately or to respond in a way that's more constructive? Well, I think one of the things that I like to help people realize is that most of our interpretation of danger isn't danger. It's our interpretation of it. So understand what you're actually facing is not something that's against you. It's something that they perceive that's against them. Most people tend to take other people personal, but if you look at other people's personal life, realize that that has nothing to do with you. It could have been an argument with their spouse, could have been a bad ride to the office, could be a worry about their child. And sometimes that that feeling is going to bleed out, if you will, in other ways. Looking at you, a tone could be stress from their boss. I need, you know, they're getting pressure from their boss. So they actually invoke that pressure onto you, but with the stern tone when they're talking to you. So just understanding there's a story behind every interpretation that you have. And reinvent your story. Give yourself a different story. This person is upset because of whatever's going on in their life, but it's not me. That alone tells your brain to calm down. And really, we're not talking about your logical brain. We're talking to the subconscious. We're not talking about you being crazy and talking to yourself back and forth. What you're trying to do is just walk yourself backwards so you do not react in a logical way. Well, and I've heard that advice probably more in the last two years of the pandemic than, you know, realize everybody's going through something right now and you don't know what they're going through. So is that where science ends then? Just realize other people are going through their own, their own pile of crap and, and we don't have to, you know, and disrupt, remind ourselves of that all day. Or is there, is there more to it? Well, more to it because you have to learn that a lot of your, I think it takes it a little deeper is to realize that some of your triggers going from the behavioral science part of my life where do those come from? Like, why do you interpret this as something negative in your life? Why do you interpret that this job sucks? Usually it's something to do with people, ourselves personally, from a childhood trigger, from a childhood emotional moment where they not they didn't get appreciation from their parents and they feel like their boss doesn't appreciate them, or they're associating that feeling of worthiness to that childhood trigger as well. So it gives you the sense of, okay, so why is this bothering me so much? If I'm driving home and I'm thinking about dot, 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 you have to start questioning, well, what's going on here with me? Because I'm allowing this to have such an impact on my life. And so yeah, it goes into a much deeper self inner reflection than it does from a job perspective, which I think the culture is now shifting to. So we have to um, understand the stories we're telling ourselves Yeah, uh, as we respond to different kind of stimuli. Mm-hmm. Um, that takes a certain level of uh, self-awareness that I'm not sure we all have uh, naturally. Is there a way to learn that? Yeah, it, it, I think people are starting to pick it up because, like you said, after COVID, you know, hit us, we became more self-aware automatically. We became very self-conscious of what our priorities were, what we truly desire. So we're already starting to become more self-reflective. And I think what it is is though we need to also read, learn to rewrite the story of why those things happen to us. And I think there's so many modalities out there now from you know, groups, I think from things like even uh, Clubhouse now from, you know, different stories of I mean, different books. There's a thousand and one books. I, I don't want to promote any particular one author, but there's a bunch of books out there on self-actualization to learn more about your own self-triggers. And I think it's really important that we do that because I always tell people work harder on yourself than you do on your job and nothing, everything else falls into play. It's just in natural propensity to do it. But most people put a lot of stock on work. And then they don't put enough stock on their own personal triggers. And that tends to bleed over into work. You, you used a term that we hear a lot, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm comfortable defining self-actualization. What are we talking about there? Well, you know, the emotional intelligence was a big, big 
push, you know, and I, all I of Dan, Daniel Kahneman's work, all that stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah. Big push. I mean, we've, we've been seeing a lot of that. And what happens, we normally water it down for packaging it and making it, you know, user, user friendly, if you will. But it's a lot of work. And one of the most important things that people forget is we usually learn about emotional intelligence so we can understand others, but we don't normally point the the thumbs back at us, you know? So self-actualization is understanding that no matter who you are, no matter what you do, people will emulate what they feel about you. So the goal is to know what you feel about yourself because that's never, ever hidden. It's always exposed by body language, by breathing, by self, uh, how you position yourself in the in a chair when you're talking to people. Their subconscious is picking that up and they're going to deem that to be something that even you think you're not you know, showing. And we need to know that. So being self actual, being self aware of your own body language and your own subconscious triggers is going to really help you lead people better. And it's going to help actually make things a lot easier for you to read others because you're so open to reading yourself. So it's not about just um, smiling big and having, you know, uh, you know, all the the posturing. It's it's so it's not about changing your your physical reactions. It's about letting those physical reactions come from a different place. Let me let me give you an example of that real quick, because it's, it's fascinating that 1991 in the Science Journal, which is really the encyclopedia for science. And as we got and discovered neuroscience and quantum physics and got deeper and deeper into that, they found 40,000 brain-like cells in the heart. They were always there, but we didn't have the tools to see them. And now that we saw them, we pu- they published it in the Science Journal, but they did not make it a big deal, but come to find out they're brain-like cells in the heart. And those brain-like cells pick up all these emotional memory from your childhood, from age, from birth to age seven. And it actually helps filter how you see the world. And we're seeing that that those brain-like cells, the way they f- interpret whatever's happening at that exact moment, changes the frequency of the aorta pushing the blood from your heart. That frequency is picked up by the people around you's hearts, and they're interpreting who you are based off of that frequency. And that's what quantum physics and neuroscience is saying is that we're this ball of energy that is actually readable. We can actually pick up people's intentions. And I think that's where people get that gut sense of people, like something's wrong with this person. It's they're picking up actually a place where they're actually able to see where that's coming from. And so that's what we're learning is that leaders can't hide, you know, that they don't like somebody by just smiling and being cordial that they can pick up the ingenuity. When people aren't genuine, it's felt. And so we have to really ask ourselves, why do I not like this person? Is there, are they showing something that I see in myself? Is there something from my past that's making me not like this person because I really don't know this person. I'm judging it off of dot, dot, dot. And when we do that, we can come to grips with that and be more genuine. And then that makes us better leaders all around. Okay. So what would be the You mentioned there's books and all that stuff out there, but what would be, I'm a leader in an organization and I don't feel like I'm as effective as I ought to be. Um, And part of it is, I, you know, let's just say I'm self-aware enough to know that I've got some, you know, something going on between my ears that's, that's really affecting that. What would it look like to figure out where am I, you know, where's this coming from? Why, you know, what is the story I'm telling myself? Where does that come from? How do you, how does one figure that out? Well, I can tell you how I figured it out because there's not one way for anybody, but I, for me, I had to write a letter to myself and re I had to put everything on paper and connect the dots of why things happened to me as a child. You know, you, you wrote, you already mentioned I was a talent agent, why I gave up being a talent agent, but you know, I was a kickboxer. Why I gave up those careers that were so successful and was putting me on the place. I wrote, had a cartoon sold to Warner Brothers. I was on my way, but I was doing really well. So what happened that, and that did that. So I had to go backwards and see, well, you know, it was from my childhood. It really started from my feelings of worthiness with my father, from being a Lashkey kid, being homeless at 15 to, you know, living on the streets and being uh, teased a lot. And all those things put a certain image of myself in front of me that my cells, going back to my memory, if I was out of that element of feeling low, I subconsciously put myself back in those situations where I felt low. I didn't feel normal when things were going well because I was always telling myself I wasn't normal. So that's what worked for me. And then reading about the body and the mind and separating myself from my story was really the key. But like I said, there's books, 
there's a bunch of books out there. If, if you ever, I can send you a list. I mean, there's so many. Joe Dispenza is good at writing it, uh, Breaking the Habits of Being Yourself. He's one of them. And the reason I bring him up is because he's kind of woo-woo, but he's hired by thousands of companies around the world to do exactly what you and I are talking about right now. Because people realize that it's more, it's not about title. It's not about position. It's about really being human and understanding how to be right. more human is much more of a leadership role than anything else now. Interesting. What's the the impact of that, or how do you how do you transfer that? I guess that one you know one one at a time kind of uh, personal self actualization to an organization. How does that? How does that? If I'm building a sales team or a leadership team, how does this science affect any of that? Well, it does. Well, I break it down into two parts. So I really go into the detail of what people how people. Uh, chemically react to certain things. So I go into what like oxytocin, what produces oxytocin, like what actions produce that hormone, that chemical that creates the feeling of socialization, emotional empathy, you know, because our culture doesn't develop empathy like it used to. I mean, the kids have grown up with, you know, playing video games. So they just click reset if they don't like something, which is why a lot of people quit jobs now, especially the younger generation, is if they don't feel like they're getting it or they're not being rewarded in some way in a quick fashion, they usually will want to reset. That's just normal. So uh, talk about what can, what things you can do to create oxytocin, which is the source for socialization, producing emotional empathy, and makes people feel close. And that's part of trust. So allowing people to feel like they're trusted, like instead of micromanaging now, it's like, hey, I want you guys to create something. You come up with it, whatever it is, I'm going to let you run with it. I'd rather us try and fail and laugh at ourselves than to make sure it's perfect. That's what companies could start doing more of instead of having this perfect way of doing something because we have to make it right, be willing to fail and laugh at it because laughter creates oxytocin as well. It's actually the same uh, uh, chemical that you feel in, when you're around trees, that ha sound, that is what makes you feel relaxed and creates it. And then uh, serotonin, what creates serotonin? Regulating your gut. And that's perception. That's data. That's instead of you being the knowledgeable person that knows everything, start using validation from others, like third party validation. Going back to our new generation, they find everything on YouTube. They find everything on Google. They don't trust a person that is an authority anymore. They trust people they don't they've never met who actually use the right visuals and tones that they appreciate. So taking that and using the things they already trust and bringing that into your organization, that's where, um, you know, a lot of consultants are doing better at now because they're third party validators and then developing a mirror neuron, which is really that path empathy is going back to understanding how the body works mechanically, not personally. So, Knowing if you're talking to somebody, how you're standing, how you're talking to them, when you're laughing, when you're, you know, when you use your own personal stories, if you should talk business or not business, those are things that happen that changes the narrative and helps become better leaders. And you, you, you I want to make sure I got that right. Mirror, M I R R O R, neurons. Yes, mirror neurons. It's called a mirror neuron, which is really it's a doorway for empathy, which uh, the Z generation has been proven they have less of because they've never hung out in the streets and played football or basketball with friends. They just played on video games. So you and I have it. I don't know how old you are, but, you know, I was married 24 years, so I, we're probably around the same bracket. But I would say that there is a mirror neuron in your, my brain and your brain where we know how to feel empathy towards each other. But the Z generation didn't develop it. They literally don't have the ability to empathize like you and I because they haven't had that interaction with people. We get empathy from pheromones from one another. And that's another thing science has proven that we can actually sense people's fear through smelling their pheromones or picking up their pheromones. Our body tells us that they're fearing, even though we rationalize and say they're not. They just look that way all the time. Our body tells us what they're feeling. We produce the same hormonal chemicals that they do subconsciously. And let's take a quick break. Good Morning HR is brought to you by Imperative, premium background checks with fast and friendly service. If you're an HRCI or SHRM certified professional, this episode of Good Morning HR has been pre-approved for one half hour of recertification credit. To obtain the recertification information, visit goodmorninghr.com and click on Recert Credits. Then select episode 43 and enter the keyword SADO, that's S-A-D-O. 
And if you're looking for even more recertification credit, check out the webinars page at imperativeinfo.com. I have 10 hours of recorded webinars, each approved for an hour of recertification credit by both HRCI and SHRM. Three are even approved for HRCI business credit, and one qualifies for ethics credit. You can access all of these webinars for free at imperativeinfo.com. And now back to my conversation with Julian Sato. So as, a, as an organization, I think what you're saying, let me summarize this, is um, let people fail um, and, and take it as a lesson. Learn, laugh. Yeah, reward effort would be the key. It's really important because it's a childhood aspiration is to play and to create. And 70% of our population are right brain thinkers, which is known as the creative side. That is going to be why people don't want to go to work anymore because they feel like they can't be creative. They're being restricted. And especially now when people are hearing on YouTube and every place else about how to be free. And I would say meditation is now a, uh, a doorway to freedom and, you know, feeling this bliss. And we're all searching for this happiness that is searchable somewhere, but that is alone going to be the deteriorating factor to people getting into a position that of authority. Most people don't want to be managers anymore. They don't want to be leaders. They want to be influencers or generators, or it's changing the narrative on, on companies. And really we need as organizations promote that at the same time, being able to leverage what we can to get what we need. So, that's interesting. So you're saying people don't want to be managers because that's not seen as a creative role. Right. That's seen as stress as having your thumb on somebody else. And yeah. And stress. Being Why would I want to live that? Yeah. Why would I want that? I, I get, you know, I want to live peace. I saw this guy on YouTube telling me that I can be a millionaire by selling his product, just buy his product for one, two, three program. I went mm-hmm. back, you know, so okay. that's where we are today. So we need to know that that's we're we're pushing in that direction. If we're saying to be a leader, you have to be serious and you have to be rigid and you got to make sure you hold people accountable. That's you can do it, but you just got to change the wording. Uh, and and change how I guess how people receive it or how they or, or how you're received as, as you know, and how you're what you're projecting. So, yeah, exactly. That's interesting. So, um, well, let's say we want to build a team then. And, uh, and let's say we're lucky enough to build a fresh team. Uh, uh, the, um, what, how does, how does the science play into designing work and, and selecting employees? Well, I guess, you know, you, you got to pay attention to if you're or, over, over analyzing at the same time, you don't want to, you don't want to belittle the, the nuances that need to take place. Right. So there's so many different levels from silos to, uh, teamwork. There's so many different ways of doing this. But what I would say for the biggest part is really recognize how you run meetings becomes the the determining factor of how people t- uh, work with each other. So silos are one of the biggest things, especially in my industry. I, I went in the mortgage industry. And so we have a lot of silos, right? So breaking down silos, being teammates and collaborating with everyone and rewarding the collaboration versus the end result is going to be the, the tell all of everything. So little analogy of that. If you reward somebody for working late because, and you say things like, Hey, I know you have kids at home. I know that, you know, you usually go home and you're with your family and you stayed work late and you took care of this. I want to really thank you for that. Well, that creates dopamine. It makes somebody feel like they've accomplished something and helped somebody else. And that creates better dopamine and is better health. It's been proven as healthier for them to feel like they've given to others than to getting. And that makes them want to do it more than to say, congratulations on closing this deal. Because what you did was you created a story that they can visualize in their head and make sure that you they can associate what they've done to what they sacrificed. And that promotes a healthy work environment. So learning how to reward people is one of the biggest things. And when you're running meetings, recognizing people for those types of things, because then when people leave, they start mim- mimicking that and recognizing their peers and their uh, subordinates the same way. And so what we've done in our industries is we've recognized only the, the the end result without really paying attention to the temperament of the end result, how we got there. Interesting. So we still, the end result still ultimately matter though, right? I mean, the company right. still has to make money. We still have to close that deal. We still have to get this project done. Right. But along the way in, in how we incentivize and motivate people, 
uh, focus more on the story that they're telling themselves about the nature of their sacrifice. Right. Okay. That has been a huge. Actually, just so you know, the military has now implemented that in boot camp for the army. So they've actually implemented this from the study found uh, in, you know, in, again, with neuroscience, you know, a kid can do push-ups. You know, he's never done push-ups before. He just joined the army to go to college, knocks out seven push-ups and he's shaking. His body's about to collapse. And the sergeant would get in there and call him all kinds of names, right? And cuss him out and just belittle him in front of everyone. And next day he would still do seven push-ups. But when the sergeant says, like, let me ask you a question. You joined the army to go to college and you're the first of your family to go to college? Yes, sir. Okay, so you've never done push-ups before and you knocked out seven just because your goal is to go to college and make sure you can take care of family. Yes, sir. The next day, he's able to do 25 push-ups. And like, what happened? Hmm. And they found that it's because the dopamine in the story infuses the empowerment to want to do more. And we've seen this with customers as well. If you need something from a customer, instead of saying, I need it, so, you know, what? I really appreciate you giving me this last week. I know you're working full time for you to do that when you're at work means a lot to me. And then asking for more, they get it done within hours. They get it done because it prom- it's, it's human nature that we are now tapping into that. We don't have to have a book on it. We just need to know how it works and just pull those levers and they just happen automatically. So it's along the lines of Simon Sinek's why and that, and that, that whole theory about understanding employees, understanding how they contribute, why what they do for the organization is important. 100%. Yeah. Simon yeah. doesn't use the science, but he uses the right words for sure. Oh, really? Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That's, so he just arrived at it from a different direction, but, yeah. but he, that's yeah. interesting. So people don't realize that whenever I can imagine something that makes other people feel grateful, wise, uh, creative, resourceful, helpful, any of those things, it creates dopamine, which improves the immune system increases sodium excretion. So you actually lose weight. <laughs> so improves concentration and it helps with memory. And just so you know, really Parkinson's disease has now been uh, correlated with cortisol, high levels of stress. And so it actually, dopamine sub- subdues that Parkinson's disease. So the more happy someone is or the more engaged they feel, the less Parkinson they've seen in those in those uh, patients. Interesting. So if we're, as we design, you know, as we try to recruit a, you know, build a team and design a team, are there specific things we should, even as trying to recruit really good talent, are there specific things, ways we should frame conversations about what the role is uh, around that why or about, you know, the, in, in attracting certain kinds of talent into the organization? Well, that's a, you know, that's a really good question. And for me, I have a certain philosophy that might be unique to others. One of the things I would say is don't oversell how great you are. It's really oh, important to understand the, the the sales pitching. We've hurt ourselves drastically by overselling how great a company is. I like right now with the recruiting I, I just did with a company I work for. I let them know this is not going to be easy. This is going to be tough. You're going to be challenged. You're not going to like some things. There are going to be a lot of miscommunications. There's going to be a lot of mishaps. And it's going to be really difficult to learn what you have to learn. I just hired 12 people that have no mortgage experience, and I'm teaching them how to underwrite. And I'm challenging them because I want them to know it's difficult. But what it is, I'm also saying I want you to be creative. I want you to use your skills. I want you to tie in your personal experiences into this because I want new blood in here that's going to bring in a new, fresh perspective. To me, that is where we should go. We should be really honest. All it takes is people to lose trust. I remember going back to what I said, the oxytocin, the serotonin, the mirror neuron. Trust is where oxytocin parts. And so if you say we lost trust by covid we said we couldn't be 100% remote. It's impossible for us to survive. COVID happened. We were 24 hours. Everyone was at home. We still survive. So companies don't, people don't trust their companies already. So when we say we have a great process, we have a great company, and they have one bad interaction with a peer, they lost trust. So I like to be honest. And that way I can tie it back to that honesty and really get people back to reality, if you will, and help them see that nothing of value is ever easy but it's still very valuable where you're at. Yeah, and that's interesting because that's something that I've promoted for a long time working with our clients, uh, especially my consulting clients on employee selection, giving that real description of the job so that, and I like to say it in a way, you know, I have to say, describe the job in a way that the person who's going to be perfect for that job will run to it and everybody else will run away. Like (laughs) in in our organization, on the background check side of the business, 
being a background check analyst is mm-hmm. basically sitting in front of two or three computer monitors doing high level, tedious data entry. I mean, a lot of it is very repetitive. I would, you know, my, you know, my high D, high I, high sociability on this would be, I can't do that job. I mean, it's just, I'm not made for that. And, uh, and so we even in our, in our application process for the analyst piece, we say, hey, this is a tedious job. You will be sitting in front of the computer for long periods of time with very little social interaction and all of those things. My introverts who run to that job, they they don't even phase them. Mm -hmm. But but an extrovert like me or somebody with a sales mentality or something like that, they're going to say, oh, this isn't the right role for me. I'd rather get and, abducted by aliens. Oh, on the yeah. <laughs> yeah, easily. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, so I think that's it. Yeah. And I, I think you're right. We, we oversell and that's part of the problem with recruiting and a lot. Of, I mean, we hire really sales, sales oriented people for recruiting mm-hmm. and you know, their, their jobs to put, you know, yeah. warm butts in a seat rather than, than find somebody who's going to really excel and love this role and, and, and fit into the organization. I think it's getting yeah. better, but I still think, too much of it is salesy. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. Any lo- last thoughts about how this science can really help us impact a, a, an organization? Well, I guess the thing I would say is just understanding that what I just said it really has nothing to do with the organization. It has to do with you personally. It has more to do with the personal development, learning that just because you have been successful or done certain things in your life. Every interaction is the only one that really matters. It has nothing to do with who you are, where you've been, what your title is. The interaction you have with that individual at that moment could be the one that changes your life and theirs. And if you put that in perspective and just be there and think what you like about that person when you're talking to them is going to be key. I mean, it's just that's key because that's going to change your frequency. I hate to use that word because I don't want to sound woo woo, but change the energy that they pick up. Because every person has really, we've deemed it six basic fears, like the fear of poverty, old age, criticism, loss of uh, income or loss of someone, um, poor health and and death, you know, so. Wow, that's so heavy. That's so many things right there. And now I've got so much anxiety. Thanks, Julian. <laughs> well, it's just, but that's human nature has those fears. But at the same time, we don't want to promote those fears. What you want to do is appreciate the moment that you're in. And so a lot of times we promote those fears by trying to sell. Like you said, fear of poverty. Hey, this job also is secure. It has a great benefits package. Well, now you just talked about something that is more of a fear-based thing versus the moment of this guy. I really like how you communicate. I really like your skill. I literally like what you bring to the table. Just understanding what to lean into, not to sell the opposite of the fear, because we're going to think about the fear going forward. So that's all. I mean, that's really what I want people to think about. Oh, great. Well, and that's all the time we have. Thanks for joining me today, Julian. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the time. And thank Man, you I for... love your glasses. I was talking to you. I love oh, your glasses. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, now I feel much, so much more rewarded now. Thank there you. There you go. <laughs> and thank you for listening. You can find previous episodes, show notes, and contact info for our guest at goodmorninghr.com or on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram. And don't forget to follow us wherever you get your podcast. Rob Upchurch is our technical producer, and I'm Mike Coffey. As always, don't hesitate to reach out if I can be of service to you personally or professionally. I'll see you next week. And until then, be well, do good, and keep your chin up.